I pray tonight that you would forgive us, Lord God, as we forgive those that have trespassed against us, Lord God. I pray tonight that you would help us to be clean and holy in your presence, Lord. Help our hearts to be softened towards your word, Lord, that we may receive it, Lord God, that it should change us, that it should mold us, Lord. I pray that it be the seed in our hearts today that would sprout up unto good fruit, Lord Jesus, so that you should be pleased with us, Lord. I pray that you have your way in this Bible study. We'll be careful to give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. 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 <clears throat> praise the Lord, everybody. Uh, what a, uh, an interesting time we're in. Um, last night's service was very powerful, um, and we got part two. I encourage you to go back and watch uh, part one that she spoke. She's 86 years old. And, 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 and delivering the word of God like that, and pastoring multiple churches and building hotels. And my Lord, she, she put me to shame. And I'm, <laughs> I'm a third of her age. Like, that's, <laughs> that's a problem. Amen. But uh, she definitely broke it down in the morning talking about the spirit of Amalek, which was the first part. And wouldn't you know it, I was driving through downtown Tampa today, and there's a pro-Palestine uh, demonstration. Yeah, they, they were sitting down. I'm like, huh, the timing of that is ultra, is ultra suspect. Jasmine called me. She was driving down there as, we, as I picked up her car from the shop. And we're just, just coming here to Bible study. They were, we were marching down there with the, with the pro-Palestine flags. So uh, it's interesting because we're going to talk a little bit about that today and what she talked about, the spirit of the Amalekites. Um, today we're getting into the first king of Israel. Uh, we are well, we are outside of the law. We're well past the first five books of the Bible. Uh, we've covered Joshua as they came into the promised land. Joshua divided up the land for their inheritance. Um, and they were supposed to do one thing with the inhabitants. What were they, what were they supposed to do? Good, y'all got it. Kick everybody else out. Wipe everybody else out of the land. Did they do that? No, they did not. And as a result of that, God left some of them in there in order for them to be a thorn in their flesh. And their gods would become a snare unto them. And thus it is, even unto this day, um, Israel has continually struggled for their independence and their freedom uh, from the people that they, they themselves left in the land. And not only that, they would begin to go and worship other gods. Oh, he's going all the way up there, y'all. He's not. Uh... <laughs> he reminds me of that one kid from Popeye, Sweet Pea. Y'all remember Sweet Pea from Popeye? Sweet Pea would march all over the whole city, never get in any trouble. He'd go on cranes and stuff. Ily has no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> huh? He was on that spinach. You know, that spinach is, 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 is you know, that, that, that stuff is better than meth. <laughs> Popeye takes some spinach, man. He could do anything. <laughs> Lay off the spinach, Ily. That's all I'm going to tell you. Praise God. I aches me spinach. All right. Where was I at? <laughs> it was one of my favorite cartoons growing up. Popeye was, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, they did not kick the people out of the land. This is Bible study starting off great tonight. <laughs> they didn't kick the people out of the land. And, and, and uh, as a result, they ended up worshiping their gods, which was the whole problem. God knew if, that, if, that, that, um, if they didn't remove their influence, their influence would end up influencing them. And that's amazing. Everybody today is trying to be an influencer, you know, online. Everybody's trying to be an, an influencer, even, you know, some, of, some people that shouldn't have no business influencing anybody. It'll be influencing. But it's a principle that God lays out in, his, in, in the scripture is this. Your enemy cannot defeat you if God is on your side. He can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you with God backing you behind you. I mean, if you're looking at a God that's part in the Red Sea, how are you going to fight a, a nation whose God parted a whole sea for them to come across, okay? And so that's, the enemy knows this. And so in order to defeat them, he's got to get them to essentially defeat themselves. He's got to subvert them and bring the corruption in from the inside. And the way to do that is to get them doing things that will get them in trouble with their God. And the first thing that will get them in trouble with their God is worshiping other gods and disobeying his word. 
So that's what happens. They get into the promised land, and they fail to remove all of their other nations. And that summarizes the book of Judges right there. They would have a battle um, against some of their oppressors. Uh, they would get in trouble with God. God would allow them to get victory. Then he would raise up a judge to judge them. That happened multiple times until we get to the book of 1 Samuel, where um, they get sick and tired of not having a king to judge them. Eli's sons were corrupt. Samuel's sons were also getting corrupt. And Samuel's up there in age. And so they told Samuel, give us a king so that we can what? Be like the other nations. They wanted to be like everybody else around them, which is a mistake because God created them to be unique from everyone else around them. So we can see the influence of other nations that they refuse to kick out already playing in their minds. They want to be like other nations. They want a king. And so God tells Samuel, they haven't rejected you, Samuel. They've really rejected me. Why did he say that? Because God was supposed to be their king. He's like, oh, so you all don't want me as a king? Which is kind of dumb, because who do you think God's going to put in as a king? It's going to just be a representation of, of God. And so uh, God tells Samuel, nevertheless, give them what they ask for, but make sure you tell them what a king is going to do. And that's where we finished up last time, about what the king will do. And so we're going to read today about the first anointed king over all of Israel. Um, and his name is, you can probably guess it, Saul. Saul. Okay. Now let's go 1 Samuel chapter 9 and start in verse number 1. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekarath, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward he was higher than any of the people. And the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul, his son, take now one of the servants with thee and arise, go seek the donkeys. And he passed through Mount Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they found them not. Then they passed through the land of Shalim and there they were not. And he passed through the land of Benjamites, but they found them not. And when they were there, and when they were come to the land of Zuth, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come and let us return, lest my father leave caring for the donkeys and take thought for us. And he said unto him, Behold, now there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go thither, parrot adventure. He can shew us our way that we should go. Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver that will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake. Is that a note or is that a verse? Nine is in parentheses. Is that a verse or a note? Both. Okay. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer, for he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Then said Paul to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went unto the city where the man of God was. And as they went up to the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water and said unto them, is the seer here? And they answered them and said, He is. Behold, he is before you. Make haste now, for he came today to the city, for there is a sacrifice of the people today in the high place. As soon as ye become into the city, ye shall straightway find him, before he go up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he come. Because he doth bless the sacrifice, and afterwards they eat that be bidden. Now therefore get you up, for about this time ye shall find him. And they went up into the city, and when they were come into the city, behold, Samuel came out against them, for to go up to the high place. Now the Lord had, said, had told Samuel in his ear, 
a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry is come unto me. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold, the man whom I spake to thee of, this same shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me unto the high place, for ye shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let thee go, and will tell thee all that is in thine heart. And as for thine donkeys that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel is not on thee and on all thy father's house? And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families in the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? And Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the parlor and made them sit in the chiefest place among them that were bidden, which were about thirty persons. And Samuel said unto the cook, Bring the portion which I gave thee, of which I said unto thee, set it by thee. And the cook took up the shoulder and that which was upon it and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, Behold, that which is left, set it before thee and eat. For unto this time hath it been kept for thee since I said, I have invited the people. So Saul did eat with Samuel that day. And when they were come down from the high place into the city, Samuel communed with Saul upon the top of the house. And they arose early, and it came to pass about the spring of the day that Samuel called Saul to the top of the house, saying, Up that I may send thee away. And Saul arose, and they went out, both of them, he and Samuel abroad. And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us, and he passed on. But stand thou still a while, that I may shew thee the word of God. Okay. Well, this is the introduction of Saul. And it gives us some character traits about Saul. First of all, what tribe is he from? Benjamin. He's from Benjamin. He's a Benjamite. Good. And what is his physical characteristic? Good. He's good looking, and he's very, very tall. Doesn't say blue eyes in there. Good job. We don't know the color eyes he had. Lord, help us. He was a very, very tall man. And he was sent on a task to go find what? That was the homework question. He was going to find the donkeys. Or his daddy, correct. And three of them to be exact, um, and they were gone for three days. Now you can, you can do the symbolism there. Anytime you see three days, it's, I think it's referring to the, the three days that Jesus will be in the, in the, in the, uh, in the tomb. <coughs> but suffice it to say, after the three days were come, there will become a king that will be anointed. So chew on that for a little bit. Uh, but Saul is not, he's not a very outwardly proud man, at least not in his introduction, which is a underrated characteristic of pride. Pride sometimes looks like humility. Yeah. I said pride sometimes looks like humility. He says, I'm just, I'm just, a, I'm just, I'm just a small, because it, humility is a condition of the heart. Not necessarily about what you do, it's about how you have what you think of yourself. And giving his circumstances, he is very inwardly proud. That's my point. Um, he says he's really from the from from the small tribe of Benjamin. He's not even from the the, the best of them. Uh, but nevertheless, he's sent upon this task to go and find donkeys. And he's unable to find these donkeys. And so they get the bright idea. His servant gets the bright idea and says, hey, there's a, there's a man of God in this city. And so why don't we go and stop by the man of God's house, who at this time they weren't called prophets, they were called seers. Why don't we go to the seer's house? And he'll be able to tell us where in the world these donkeys are. 
because we need to find these donkeys. We're not making too, many, too good a progress. It says, so they say, okay, well, uh, if we're going to go to the man of God, we've got to bring a gift. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> go bring a gift. You don't come before God without a gift. Amen. So they walk in there with a gift, and, well, they, 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 they prescribe to go in there with a gift, but they don't know that God has already dealt with Samuel, saying, there's going to come a man to you tomorrow. He's going to be... Uh, He's going to come your way by this day. The guy that comes your way, that's going to be the next king. So God has arranged this whole thing. God is the one that sent the donkeys off the stray <laughs> and had Saul going looking for him and has already prepared Samuel to go and see this. Now, God knows exactly what he's doing. He knows Saul's character. He knows his, his traits. He knows what is going to be set up and what his future will be because he's going to show us a principle. And this is what we normally get in the Bible. What you normally get in the Bible, when God is going to manifest something, he'll give you the fleshly version first. Then he'll bring the better version next, right? Um, he even says in the creation days, the evening and the morning. So the dark comes before the light. Evening and morning were the first day. Then you got uh, Cain first and Abel was next, okay? You got uh, Ishmael first and then I I Isaac came next. You got Esau first, and then Jacob came next. And then, okay, you got Joseph's elder brothers. They came first, but Joseph was the last um, before Benjamin was born. Um, same thing when we deal with, with Jesus. He was the last Adam. You got the fleshly one first, and then you got, okay, Jesus last. Well, Saul was become first, and what you're going to find out about Saul is that as soon as he is given the position, all of his inward character gets amplified and magnified um, to be shown outwardly. <clears throat> Essentially, Saul is going to be the quintessential version of a hypocrite. He's going to seek the image, not necessarily the heart of God. He's going to want to look the part, because he already does look the part. He's the tallest dude in all of Israel. This is like if God anointed Shaq to be king. No, not Shaq. Because oh, you say Shaq not good looking, not not with the cockeyed and, <laughs> huh? Who's the tallest good looking dude in in in, in America, <clears throat> ladies? I guess that's a very subjective question, huh? Okay, well, we'll 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 go on past that. <clears throat> you, you you would pick you? I only think you're the tallest dude in this church. I only think you're the tallest guy in this church. You just shrunk. Well, that yeah, disqualifies you. Disqualifies you. So Saul has all the image, but seemingly he is, he is, he is very humble. Um, at least that's what he says when he meets Samuel. Because when they finally get to Samuel, um, Samuel pretty much tells him, um, look, I'm going to tell you all that is in your heart. You didn't really come here for me. The donkeys are already found. There's a greater purpose over over your life, and, and God is going to do something great in you, because he says, all of Israel is up, is up on you. Verse 20, he says, as, as for thy donkeys that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and all thy father's house? And Saul answered and said, am not I a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin. Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? And so Saul obviously thinks very little about his pedigree. Um, he, he thinks that, that, that he's not deserving of this position because of his pedigree, um, which is, again, it's a prideful statement masked as humility because nobody's deserving so what, he's a, what, what he has said without saying is that the person who's going to be king has to come from greatness. And I'm not. But you're saying all of Israel is going to fall to me. So he's essentially <laughs> showing his colors right here. Um, Least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin, wherefore speakest thou so unto me? 
And so Samuel does some other things to, to get him prepared for what he's about to do. So now let's, let's look at the anointing of Saul. And this, this I think, is pretty funny. Uh, so let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 10, pick up in verse 1. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, It is not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance. When thou art departed from me today, then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sep sherry, sepulcher, sepulcher mm -hmm. in the border of Benjamin at Zelzah, and they will say unto thee, The donkeys which thou wentest to seek are found. And lo, thy father left the care of the donkeys, and sorrow, sorroweth for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? Thou shalt go on forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor, and there shall meet thee three men going up to God to Bethel, <coughs> one carrying three kids, and another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a bottle of wine. And they will salute thee, and give thee two loaves of bread, which thou shalt receive of their hands. After that, after that, thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines. And it shall come to pass, when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabret, tabret and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. Mm. And let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings, and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry, till I come to thee, and shew thee what thou shalt do. Mm -hmm. And it was so, so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass, when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets, then the people said one to another, What is that? is come in unto the son of Kish. Is Saul also among the prophets? And one of the same place answered and said, But who is their father? Therefore it become a proverb. Is Saul also among the prophets? And when he had made an end of prophesying, prophesying, he came to the high place. And Saul's uncle said unto him and to his servant, Whither went ye? And he said, To seek the donkeys. And when we saw that they were nowhere, we came to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Tell me, I pray thee, what Samuel said unto you. And, and Saul said unto his uncle, He told us plainly that the donkeys were found, but of the matter of the kingdom, whereof Samuel spake, he told him not. And Samuel called the people together unto the Lord of Mizpah, and said unto the children of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all kingdoms, and of them that oppressed you. And ye have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adverse adversities and your tribulations. And ye have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes, and by your thousands. When Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri Ma was taken, and Saul the son of Kish was taken. And when they sought him, he could not be found. <laughs> Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if the man should yet come hither. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. And they ran and fetched him tents. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any other people from his shoulders and upward. And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. Mm -hmm. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. Mm. Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom, and he wrote it in a book and laid it before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And Saul went 
also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. Okay. So Samuel anoints Saul to be king and tells Saul this anointing is going to be confirmed with a spiritual prophetic utterance. You're going to find some men that are going to worship. And this is after the oil is poured upon him. Yeah, they're going to be by Rachel's sepulcher, which is her grave. And, and, and you're going to go up there with them, and you're going to salute them, and they're, uh, and, and, and they're going to give you loaves of bread, receive the bread. So they're going to bless this new king. And when he gets around them, the Bible says God gave him a new heart. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he began to prophesy along with the prophets. And, and people were wondering, well, wait a minute, Saul's prophesying. Is he now a prophet? Well, the obvious answer is no. He's not a prophet, but if you get around the prophets, uh, if you get in an atmosphere of the prophetic, you start to prophesy. That'll be a lesson one of these days about spiritual giftings, um, about yielding to the spirit of prophecy when it's over a particular place or a particular service. Yes, sir. Yes, by those men specifically, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, what was Saul looking for when, when Samuel found him? It was the, it was the donkeys. He was looking for the donkeys. Yeah, that was a week before. He was from ben, a tribe of Benjamin. He was a Benjamite, and so Saul has now been anointed as the king of Israel. He's got the spirit of God upon him, not in him, upon him. There's a difference. We have the Spirit of God living in us. In those days, the Spirit of God would come upon them. <clears throat> this is why David could write, Take not thine Holy Spirit from me, but restore unto me the joy of salvation. Because uh, that's what happened to Saul. The Spirit would end up being taken from Saul. It would leave Saul and leave him in a state of depression when it happened. Um, so the Spirit of God came upon Saul. The Lord gave Saul a new heart at this moment. And he began to prophesy. Yes, sir. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Yeah. It's like having a roommate that's mad at you and won't, don't want to come around you. <laughs> yeah. Huh? You go through that all the time? Lord, brother John, help us. It's not, a, it's not a marital seminar, family seminar. We're talking about Saul. Jeez, you're trying to take us there. And so this man prophesies, and, then, and, and people see him prophesying. He comes back to his uncle, and his, and his, and his uncle's like, where you been? Well, I, I went to go seek the donkeys, uh, but I, I came to Samuel. And his uncle said, well, tell me what Samuel said. And so tall, Saul told him half of the story. Um, he didn't tell him that he was a new king, that the spirit of God was upon him, that he had been anointed, and that he had prophesied. And as Samuel had made him a new king, he told him the other stuff. This, this lets you know what he thinks about this, this new position that God has chosen him for. And if that's not enough, Samuel gets up and calls everybody together, all of Israel. He said, look, get all the tribes up right now. Everybody come out here. <laughs> verse 20, and when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. And when he caused all the, the tribe of Benjamin to come near uh, by their families, the family of Matri was taken. And Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. And when they sought him, they couldn't find Saul. So they're looking for Saul. This is, this is Saul's own anointing ceremony. And he's hiding. Among, among the stuff, actually. Not even among the people. He's hiding among the stuff. He's the new king. Not only is he the new king, he's the biggest dude in Israel. Can you imagine Shaq? 
Right, this is why it's stupid. Can you imagine Shaq trying to hide in the corner like, who, me? <laughs> no, man, God has chosen you. These people are good. This is a horrible a coronation ceremony is my point. And they have to go find Saul and bring him up before the people. And, and this is, I can understand a little bit why Saul is hiding. You know why Saul is hiding? First of all, he's a little bit of a coward. He's a little bit of a coward. Second of all, this is not a positive anointing ceremony. This is negative. Because Samuel said, uh, you have rejected God. Okay, verse 19. And you have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversaries and your tribulations. And you have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and your thousands. In other words, God's getting ready to give you what you ask for. Can you imagine that? Play this out in your own mind. God has a plan for you. God said, my plan is for you, me to be your king. And you guys are, are so, I'm not saying you guys, but let's hypothetically say, you guys are so disobedient that you get completely destroyed by your enemies. You're going through hell and high water. You can't get victory at any time. You just, you're just not experiencing any of the promises. And so instead of actually doing what God says for you to do, you cry to God to give you a king in rejection of the God that saved you in the first place. And then God finally gives you a king and says, all right, you rejected me, so here you go. Here he is. Behold, you're a king. Da, 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 da. And nobody's there. <laughs> That's hilarious to me. I don't know. I find that hilarious. I find that very anticlimactic, and I find that a, a very good representation of the effectiveness of King Saul versus God being their king. God was supposed to be their king. Now, why in the world would you want a king when God saved you from the Egyptians? Why in the world would you want a king when God gave you victory over the Amalekites? They didn't have a king when God gave them victory over Jericho. Yeah, Joshua, he wasn't their king. Why do we need a king now? Well, it, it was their own solution to a problem that they themselves had created. It's fig leaves, essentially. And so that's a lot of what Saul's ministry is, is going to be. And this, this kind of sums it up right here. And so they brought Saul out, verse 26. Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose heart God had touched. Now, even though this was not God's idea, it was man's idea. God is still going to back the authority of the king and set the people's hearts towards the king. The Bible says there are men whose hearts God had touched to follow Saul. So he's not going to put him in this position and set him up for failure. Yeah. He gave him what he's asked for. So all the authority rests upon King Saul. And the hearts of the people are towards, not all of them. There are some children of Belial that said, well, how is this guy going to save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, <laughs> but held his peace. So not everybody believed, but a large company of people believed. So now Israel finally has a king, and they've got the tallest guy in the nation. They have what looks like a king. They have somebody to act in the place of a king. But let's see how his character is going to flesh out. Um, Saul is one that doesn't really have too many um, how we call shining moments. I think I preached about one of his shining moments when he united everybody together um, to go to battle against the people on the far eastern side of Israel. But let's turn right now um, to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15. They go through some bouts with the Philistines. You can read about that when he took the sacrifice, made a sacrifice of his own accord. But we're going to hop forward just a little bit. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And let's look at his, probably his biggest failure right here. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. 
Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Tel Ayan, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, and Saul, smote, and Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refused, that they destroyed utterly. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's, 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 uh, let's keep going. Verse, uh, uh, verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Mm. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place and is gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly (coughs) destroyed. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, Stay on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made head of the tribe of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the uh, Malachites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the soil and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Samuel said unto, and Saul said unto Samuel, Yeah, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. Mm. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, yep. and to hearken than the fat of rams. For, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, yes. and stubbornness is as an inequity and idolatry. Uh-huh. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Paul's right there. Okay, backstory. Who are the Amalekites? Correct. They are... If you go back further, they're from the lineage of Esau. This is kindred stuff happening here. Okay. Amalek is from Esau. So, I mean, this goes back multiple generations, back that far. You know, we're talking about, at this point, you know, eight, 800 years or so, potentially. Okay, so this is, that's, that's who they are. Now, go ahead. Goliath. Um, he was a Philistine, so no, sir. Um, no, sir. But Amalek, the Amalekites attacked Israel as they were coming out of Egypt, and they attacked them from the rear. And all of the weaker people in, the, in that 
camp, that caravan, would have been in the rear. So they attacked them at their most vulnerable position. They didn't attack the warriors. They attacked the people on the fringes at the rear. And Moses had to go up onto a mountain with Aaron and her to have his hands lifted up in order for them to fight that battle with Joshua down there in the battlefield. And if you read the rest of that, I think it's in Exodus chapter 16. God swore that he would utterly destroy the Amalekites and wipe them off. And now here we are hundreds of years later, and it's finally time for them to be wiped out. It's finally time for God to fulfill the word that he gave to Moses. He even told Moses, write this down in the book. I'm going to destroy them. And so Saul is the one to do it. He tells Saul, go up and utterly destroy the Amalekites. Let's look at the directions. It's very clear. Yep. Thus said the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel. First of all, lesson number one, you never get away with what you do to God. You're never going to get away with what you do to God. He remembers. Only way to get him to not remember is to get, go down in the waters in baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Hello, somebody. You got to have your sins removed. Otherwise, you may have gotten away with it for a day. You may have gotten away with it for a week. You may have gotten away with it for a couple of years like David did with his sin with Bathsheba. You may have gotten away with it for a couple of hundred years, but eventually God is going to visit. He said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. So you don't want to owe God a debt. He's going to come back and pay for him. <laughs> and so today he's like, oh, I remember Amalek. Now it's time. It's reckoning time. So he tells him, look, I want you to go and verse 3, smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. And spare them not, but slay both man and woman and infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Kill everything and everybody. Wipe them out. Sounds very harsh, but just wait till the end of the Bible study. I guarantee you, you won't think it's that harsh. And so Saul went up there and, and, and he, he kind of did it. He smote the Amalekites, but he took Agag, the king, alive. He destroyed the people, but they kept what they thought was good. Verse 9, but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs. Look at this. And all that was good. <clears throat> so not even everybody, everything that they thought was good, they kept it alive. And, <clears throat> excuse me, everything that they, that they thought was vile, they destroyed. So what's the problem here? He didn't completely obey. He used, they all collectively used their own logic to decide for themselves what to kill and what to save alive. Here we go. It is that tree of knowledge of good and evil again. You're trying to decide for yourself what is good and what is evil. Instead of just obeying the word of God, when he says get rid of something, get rid of it. If he says get put away all malice, put away all malice. If he says forget, stop, stop lying, put away all lies. White lies, black lies, yellow lies, gray lies, 50 shades of gray lies. Put away all the lying. Hello, somebody. If he said the Bible says flee fornication, that means flee from it, run from it, depart from it, get away from it. Because if you don't destroy it, first of all, you have now disobeyed the word of God, number one. Number two, that sin is going to be treated like witchcraft. That's what it means when it says to, dis, uh, excuse me, let's, let's go back. Let me read it for you verbatim. Uh, 1 Samuel 15, um, verse 22. Hath the Lord... As great delight in burnt offerings and sacrificing as is obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of ram. So what is he saying? You, you, you're trying to, to sacrifice means to repent. That's what you do when you sacrifice. You're repenting. Okay. Saul, Samuel's telling you wouldn't have to repent and sacrifice if you would have just obeyed in the first place. See, it's a foolish thing to enter into what we would call presumptuous sin 
with the intention of just repenting after you're done. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just offer God the sacrifice. No, God told you to kill them all. So that, that make no sense. Well, Lord, I, I, I disobeyed you to sacrifice this unto you. Like, what? You disobeyed God to sacrifice the thing that God told you to kill in the first place? Wouldn't it make sense to just o- obey it? Mm. And then Samuel says this. He says, verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of what? And stubbornness is as iniquity is as iniquity and idolatry. What he means is this, this. God deals with those sins like they're witchcraft. He deals with rebellion like it's witchcraft. And what's he doing with witchcraft? Anybody know? Kill it. He suffer not a witch to live, the Bible says. Iniquity and idolatry. What was the sin for iniquity and idolatry? You got to get rid of it. Get it out. Stone. So what he's, what he's essentially telling you, the sin that Saul has just committed is as grave and will be dealt with like, like, like witchcraft. Yes, sir, Brother John. Oh, you're missing something. Just a little, and I'm going to show you here in just a second. And so Saul decides up on his mind and the people, he allows the people, which is, which is the next character trait of a weak leader. Samuel confronts Saul, said, what are you doing? Because he comes up, Saul's all happy. I did what you said. And in the background you hear, bad, bad. And Samuel's like, what is this bleeding of sheep that I hear? If you did what I said, why do I hear sheep in the background? Oh, well, he was going to sacrifice them. And, and then so Samuel calls him to task. And his answer is, well, the people did it. Weak leader. You know why? Because he's unwilling to take accountability. He's the leader. He's the king. It's his responsibility. It's his responsibility. He's the king. Now, this is not a democracy. This is not, a, this is not America, a constitutional republic. The king's word goes. So he, all he has to do is speak a word and say, we're killing everything in here, and they would have had to follow his instruction. So instead, well, he, he did the same thing that Adam did. Uh, did you eat of this? Who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the fruit? Uh, it was the woman. <laughs> He's pointing the finger. Yes, sir. Oh, Jesus. You can leave it going off top of myself. Don't worry about it. Praise God. Jesus' name. Yeah, we'll pray for both of them and we'll, we'll close out today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, man. All right. And, and so he saved them alive. And, and uh, where was I at? I, I lost my train of thought. Correct. He pointed the finger to the people, to him, to the people that was following him, saying that they, it was their fault. When that's, that's just a deflection. And this goes to show you, you know, this is the same, you would expect the same guy that was hiding when his, his ceremony was his time to be anointed to respond like this. And so the Lord said to this, and Samuel, Saul said unto Samuel, I have, oh, I, no, excuse me, verse 23, for rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity as the, and, and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Now, you would think this is going to be a, a huge, oops, I messed up, let's repent. Let's see how Saul responds to this. Verse 24. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent. 
for he is not a man that he shall that he should repent. And then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me. I have sinned, yet honor me, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord thy God. You see that? That here comes yeah. the pride. It's coming out now. Yeah. So pause right there, sis. So he 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 fake repents. I have sinned. I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. So he says, pardon my sin. And Samuel's like, no, I can't do that. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you. And so as Samuel's walking away from Saul, Saul, who is obviously bigger than him, tries to yoke up Samuel, the man of God, grabs his garment and rips it. You know, because you can imagine a scuffle. He's walking away. And, and as soon as I can imagine, he just turns and says, Thus saith the Lord, this day the kingdom is rent from you. Like, ooh, my Lord, Jesus, help us, Holy Ghost. And you would think that Saul would repent after that. But then, this is what he says in verse 30. I have sinned. Yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord thy God. So he's not even interested in really repenting and getting his heart right before God. What he is interested in is being looking good before the people. That's all he wants. That's all that matters to him. He's not interested in having a heart to obey the voice of the Lord. He just wants his image to remain intact. He wants his position to remain intact. He's not willing to repent. He just wants to look good, um, which, which is a problem because God has said, now he has chosen a neighbor of thine that is better than you. And also the strength of Israel, that's God. He is the strength of Israel. Will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. So Saul's essentially telling, Samuel's telling Saul, like, listen, God's going to replace you and Israel's going to be just as strong. He's chosen someone that is, that is better than you, which is, which is a, a principle. God works by, by replacing. He's going to, if we, have a, if we just won't do what God has called us to do, he can and will replace. He can and will replace. Move on, um, especially in this scenario, because now um, what you're going to find out is that Saul's mistake did not just affect him. To answer your question, Brother John, turn very quickly. I think it's to 1 Samuel uh, chapter number. Th- I'm looking for the zigzag. 30. Yep. Because uh, they saved some of them alive. That's the point. Well, we got to get everybody else on the same page. So 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse number 1. Uh, no, just the first two verses. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invited the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire mm. and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So here we are. Now, this is David. Saul is still alive, but he's only, he's only, he's only going to be alive for one more chapter. He's old. He's about to die. He's at the end of his life. And Saul's refusal to utterly destroy the Amalekites, David now has to deal with them because they captured all the women and children in Ziklag and burned the whole city down. So are you, are, you, are you getting the picture here? God knew what was going to happen way back when he dealt with Saul. That's why he told Saul to utterly destroy them. Because he knew what they were going to do. 
And this is the question that I, it irks me when people say this, especially atheists. Well, if God was such a good God, why would he sanction the destruction of women and children? Because God knows the end from the beginning. And he knows what they're going to do. He knows what they're going to act. He knows what they're going to say. Hello, somebody. He knows all of that. So if he says kill him, he knows. He's sovereign. He can do that. He's God. And he's still a good God in doing so. And so he knew that, you know, this is another generation. We're talking about in, at least, what, to, uh, 15, 10 to 15 years later, here come those same Amalekites down the Ziklag. They take all the women and children captive, and they burn the whole city down with fire. Now, if Saul had done what God had told him to do, he wouldn't have to be dealing with this. So guess what? Saints of God, there are consequences to disobeying the word of God. Consequences. And sometimes those consequences outlive even your own generation. They outlive you. You'll be dealing with problems months, years on because we disobeyed and would not remove something and utterly destroy something out of our lives that God has called us to destroy. The consequences, it doesn't just go away like that. That's what the, uh, uh, Ms. Trout said uh, last night. It said, man, if, if the, Jesus said once, once you, he's cleaned that house up and removed that devil, he said the devil comes back and finds a clean house and finds seven more spirits more wicked than him and comes back. So, <laughs> so we have to, we have to, what God says remove, we have to remove it. We have to obey the word of God. We can't decide upon ourselves what we think is good and think that we know better than God. It's better to just go ahead and obey God in the first place. And that's not even the last time. Way back towards the book of Esther, the Jews are facing an annihilation. And there's a bad guy that wants to kill all the Jews. His name is Haman. And guess what he is? He's an Agite from King Agag that was spared. So they face annihilation multiple times based off of Saul's disobedience. This is why God said, I have to rip the kingdom from him. And I'm finding a man, that's, uh, the Bible says, after his own heart, that will, that will do what the Lord tells, us, tell, tells him to do. So this is the failure of Saul. And, and since let's go ahead and finish this out. I know we're a little bit behind. Let's go ahead and finish this out. 1 Samuel 15. Um, uh, where we leave off. Verse 31 to the end. There's only about five verses left. Verse 31. Mm -hmm. So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. Then said Samuel, Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately. And Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, as thy sword hath made women childless, so shall my mother be childless among women. And Samuel hooed Agag in, places, in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house, and Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul. And the Lord repented that he made Saul king over Israel. Mm. And so Samuel goes up, and Saul goes up and worships with Samuel. Again, he's not interested in actual repentance. He's just interested in looking good. Lord, keep us from this spirit right here. Just save reputation in front of everybody. You know, instead of actually repentance, we just want to look right. Instead of actually being right. There's a difference. And, 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 and David had his failures too, but we have a whole psalm of David's repentance where he was not, in, not one time in that psalm did he say to keep him as king over Israel. He wasn't interested. He was interested in being right with God, whether that meant his position or not. And so Saul, Saul, Saul just wanted to keep his position. He said, come worship with me before the elders. And then when his position is going to be threatened, he's going to get jealous. Mm, help us, Holy Ghost. And so, now, here's another principle, and we'll close with this here today. S Saul, the Spirit of the Lord is going to begin to depart from Saul. And um, he's 
at this point, he is rejected. However, Saul is still going to be in the position of king for a long time, which goes to show us this. Spiritual death is not always instant. Spiritual death is not always instantaneous. It takes time because Saul is going to remain king for at least another 13 years after this incident. So he's in the position, but God has left him. He's functioning without God. Jesus said, look, <laughs> what happens when a branch doesn't abide? It what? Withers. You ever seen a branch leaf wither? That happened in two seconds? No, that thing will stay green for some days, I think, until it'll finally, it'll finally, eventually, it'll wither, and it will die. It will be a slow, slow death process. And that's, that sometimes can be very deceptive for us as people of God, because uh, we will disconnect ourselves from the power of God, from the will of God, from the word of God. And there will be no instantaneous repercussion, but it will be a slow fading away until eventually we're lukewarm, like Jesus said in Revelation. And eventually you get cold, and eventually backslide. One preacher said backsliding is not a blowout, it's a slow leak. And you can still be in the position, functioning, but have a slow leak and be departed from God. And at that point, deception can take hold, and, and, and you know, it takes a, a man or a word of God to come and, and to realize. So we really have to be careful that we're not just functioning without God, just existing apart from the will of God in a position, mind you, especially when you're talking about positions of leadership, in a position but not really in the will of God. The Spirit has left you. That gives way for bitterness. It gives way to jealousy. Saul's going to suffer greatly from that. He's going to try to kill David. <laughs> David's going to be on the run from his life and hadn't done anything wrong just yet. This is what happens when the Spirit of God begins to withdraw from him. So he's really an example and, and a microcosm of what will happen through the first two eras of the kingdom. Because that's what these three kings represent. I want you to know that. We've been going through this whole Old Testament, and we've been talking about types and shadows. Well, these first three kings represent three eras of kingdoms. That's why they all rule for 40 years. And each characteristic of the kingdom is going to be a, a microcosm of what happens on a grander scale. This first kingdom was the natural kingdom of Israel. David's going to come and bring in what's going to be a reference to the spiritual kingdom that is the church. Solomon's going to come in and bring the millennial kingdom, which is the kingdom of peace. And so Saul represents the first kingdom that could never fulfill what it was called to do. It was hypocritical, meaning it only looked good outwardly, but inwardly they didn't fulfill the purpose. And they would be caught up and get jealous of the next one to come and try to persecute it, which is what the Jews did to the church. Are you seeing that come to life? Now, when we get to talk about David and his anointing and his entrance and introduction, you're going to see Christ in him, even at his calling. Which brings me to my homework question. <clears throat> see if you know it. How many older brothers did David have? Brother John, you know. I knew you was going to know it. Do you know it? You, only, you can only say it if you're sure you know it. If you're not sure, then don't say it. How many older brothers? Uh -uh, I know you know it. Huh? I'm not interested in fair. Hey, Jesus wasn't fair either. <laughs> yeah, he's right. He wasn't fair. It could be seven, it could be 12, it could be 40, it could be three. Those are all important numbers. Five sometimes is in there. Yeah, you got to sleep a week on this. Go read it. All right. If you think you know it, give me the name of the eldest. But you don't know that. Superbook. 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 
It is. It's the most popular anointing story ever. I haven't seen that one yet. I have to go back and watch it myself. Maybe I'll learn something. <laughs> y'all are expounding on this. I'm going to just let y'all teach the next lesson. <laughs> you got a question, Brother Joe? Go ahead. You can stop the live stream now, Brother Joe. Yeah, it happened. 